Uh, Leslie, what do you think the impact of the coronavirus is having on religious practice and observance? Well, I think that that sort of question ultimately will need to be looked at when it's all over. My perception is anecdotal because I get around and I meet people and I experience uh, religious and spiritual responses to everything that's happening on the internet. So uh, my evidence base is uh, that, really. It's um, based upon uh, fellow feeling with some of the things that I see and uh, a feeling, really, of difficulty uh, when I look at certain other ways in which coping happens. Denial, for example. Suppression, for example. Uh, those things are happening, too. People refusing to look the facts in the face. Um, I've lived through um, moments of, of terrific difficulty uh, in other places at different times. I mean, there was the earthquake in my beloved Haiti just 10 years ago. A quarter of a million people died in 52 seconds. Um, and I smelled the stench in the air and saw the desolation everywhere and so on. And I remember, and can now reflect upon it 10 years later, I remember how important faith was. It was almost the only resource left to people um, as they climbed out of that dark pit that, um, that circumstances had uh, caused them to fall into. So, so I know what religion can mean. I've seen it at work in such circumstances, and I'm just hoping that that's exactly what's happening now uh, in all our faiths. That, um, that place we can dig stuff out from is uh, the only place sometimes as we try to make sense of incohate and and almost uh, unbelievable and bewildering things that are happening around us. As a Methodist minister yourself, you also uh, serve communities, so in this case, um, the Methodist Church. What lessons are there um, that uh, you can bring, both from your experience overseas in Haiti and other places, um, because this is the first time many people would have experienced a plague, if you like, um, this sort of isolation um, that isn't so unheard of in other parts of the world. No, indeed. And um, let me just say that uh, I've looked at some of the contributions made by other people in this remarkable series you're putting together. And I, I suspect I'm the only person so far, I, I may be wrong, uh, who uh, did, was not born into faith, who had no faith at the beginning of his life and had to find it, um, and, um, and who indeed was quite critical of uh, the faith that I saw in others. And although I've become a Christian and feel at my advanced age um, uh, more uh, the need to cling to what is at the very heart of my faith than I ever have, I have never lost that feeling of, uh, of dislike for uh, much of the accretion that religion picks up in the course of its life. Uh, the cant, the double thinking, um, the, um, the dualism between uh, the material lives that we live and the spiritual aspirations that we have, uh, the way of judging other people and so on and so forth, and uh, the, the artifice of, of building towers um, to encapsulate uh, so-called the faith, but which really are a house of cards when, when push comes to shove. And in this particular crisis, push has come to, to, to shove. And for me, I would want uh, to demolish those houses of cards. I want to declutter my religion. I want to remind myself of what it's really all about. And, and I, I just feel that uh, there are many things that are important or have become important for aesthetic reasons or in order to buttress prejudice within the believing community. And I want to, be sh I want to shed all of that in order that, um, that, for me as a Christian, I cling more and more closely to the person of Jesus every day. I've just finished reading Amos Oz's uh, final novel, um, Judas, and, and I'm so taken with the discussion, the honest discussion in there um, by, by Jewish voices um, about the person of Jesus and the differentiation that's made in there between the Jesus who should command the interests of anybody and everybody and the Jesus that has been colonized 
by his so-called followers and turned into an instrument to impose their view of the world. And for me, I've become that. And what I'd love to think is that amongst Jews and Muslims and people of other faiths, uh, this might be a moment when we can all look at how we can declutter what we've accumulated over the years. I've moved from a five-bedroomed house into a two-bedroomed house, and I know what decluttering means. And things that I thought I could never live without, I've learned to live without. Now, is that going to be the case for us in the spiritual communities? And what might that look like, particularly in light of the COVID-19 virus? In other words, your aspiration for decluttering is something that many people will share as a universal value. But what about the particular, the particular lessons? What would your Jesus say, for example, right now in the middle of this outbreak? Well, when I stand um, at a food bank uh, with Muslims and Jews, um, I feel that my Jesus is saying something about where he wants me to be. Not saying to the Muslim, hey, think like me, or the Jew, you should, uh, you should have embraced what was offered you 2,000 years ago. Not saying any of that, not thinking any of that, but saying, faced with the needs of humanity, we, in the household of faith, each of us clinging to what is core in our respective faiths, but recognizing that each of us has integrity in the way that we do that, we address not the buttressing of our own internal needs, but the needs of suffering humanity. I think that the outward lookingness that will be imposed upon us as a result of this COVID uh, disaster that we're living through should see the people of faith at the very forefront of the rebuilding of community and the prioritization of uh, bringing relief to suffering people. Well, I suppose you're absolutely right that uh, a virus like this knows no boundaries. You know, it doesn't recognize gender or ethnicity, age or religiosity. Uh, it's something that we all have to face. Um, and I suppose that's something that religious belief and practice also knows. This the universality, the connection, the interconnectedness of humanity. And that's something that you're obviously um, pursuing in your work. So if there's one thing, as we draw this to a close, that you'd want to, one thought of what the long-term implications of this will be, one particular thought, Leslie, rather than the, the universal decluttering, one particular thing, what would that be? Well, I, I, I simply have to say that uh, I'm, I'm in the last years of my life a, a politician, and I know what challenges we're going to face in the political and social sphere. We've learned such important lessons about the fact that the people we rely most on are the people we pay least. Now, the thing that I want as we try to reimagine, um, uh, to, uh, to, to rebuild uh, the society we're living in, that we don't just go back to our default position of doing things or getting as near to doing things as we've always done them, but that the challenge that has to be met in terms of rebuilding our world is a challenge that will be headed, or the response to that challenge, headed by us in the religious communities. We know about the dignity of difference. We can hold hands as we look at this, this shattered world, and we're on the front line of bringing a new way of building society. I mean, the scriptures are full of that. It's the, it's the theology of the return, not to things as they were, but to a new chapter. We should have learned those lessons over the thousands of years that we've been assimilating these truths. Let us show what it takes. Reverend Leslie Griffiths, thank you very much.